This episode is generously sponsored by NordVPN. In these crazy times, our screens have become a major gateway to happiness. But as the geo-blocking notifications remind you, the fat cats who own the 10 different streaming platforms we're supposed to pay for individually don't want us to be happy, do they? They want our money so they can be happy. And like sheep, we just allow these asinine geographical streaming limitations to happen. Let's pull the proverbial wool over their eyes for a change with NordVPN. NordVPN allows you to safely and securely route your IP address throughout 59 countries, so geography limitations are a thing of the past. For example, when I'm craving NBC's hit series Friends, because I don't really have any friends of my own, but I don't feel like purchasing a whole new streaming service to do so, I just use NordVPN's one-click connect to connect to a UK server. And voila, a whole new world of shows and movies are at my fingertips, with Ross and Rachel, who were on a break, and the whole Central Perk gang right back in my Netflix catalog. Then, when I'm done with my British double life, I can quick connect to the closest and fastest US server, and bam, I'm back in America, reaping all of the digital benefits of my own locale, searching securely and browsing without fear of privacy breaches or data mining, Right now, you can go to nordvpn.com slash Merck or use the coupon code M-E-R-C to get a two-year plan along with a bonus gift at a huge discount. A note before we begin. This is still an ongoing and active investigation. Police have not officially released any information regarding suspects, motive, or possible accomplices, if any. All information presented in this video is based off of published media reports and is meant to relay information as reported by the media, not to make accusatory statements. All subjects reported on in this case are presumed innocent until proven guilty. This is part two of Dark Canyon. There have been a surprising number of missing or murdered persons cases in the area known as Dark Canyon located in Malibu, California, within the last decade. The victims are all relatively young, have family, look seemingly happy, and all have a plethora of people advocating for them. The friends and family of Matrice Richardson, 24, Elaine Park, 20, Tristan Baudet, 35, and Matthew Weaver Jr., 21, continue to search for answers in these mysterious, unsolved, and open cases. Born on September 24, 1996, Elaine Park was 20 years old when she went missing. A lover of musical theater and an involved member of multiple dance companies, she was also an aspiring actress. She is credited as being an extra on popular television shows such as ER, Mad TV, Desperate Housewives, Crazy Stupid Love, and Role Models. She previously attended Pierce College in Los Angeles, but dropped out to work full-time. An amateur rapper, Elaine also wrote spoken word poetry about her own life. Elaine's friends and her brother recall that she had a childhood lacking the unconditional love typically given to children. Her mother and father had gotten a divorce as an adolescent, and though they still had children under 18, Elaine's father introduced the idea of and offered to sign a document that would revoke his parental rights and sever all ties with his children. Though that document never came into fruition, Elaine's father was not a major part of her life. Elaine lived with her mother and was financially dependent on her. However, their relationship was reportedly not close. As neighbors recall, they heard fighting often late into the night. According to all witnesses and digital artifacts, Elaine Park was last seen alive during the early hours of January 28, 2017. Of Korean descent, she had brown hair and wide brown eyes that were usually meticulously lined with eyeliner. She was 5'6 and roughly 125 pounds, and was last seen wearing a white sweatshirt, or possibly a hoodie, and denim shorts, or possibly gray sweatpants. Those close to her recall that she often wore a necklace which had an E on it. Elaine's mother, like the parents of the other children lost to the canyon's dark secrets, was at the forefront of the search for her child and was the one who initially agreed to work with investigative journalist Neil Strauss in hopes of raising more money for the search for her daughter. 
However, in a decidedly 180 degree change in the direction of the case, the investigation into Elaine's disappearance eventually turned inward and began to focus on the many inconsistencies of the narrative of events and alibi supplied by the very person who first reported the 20 year old missing one who had been supposedly fighting tooth and nail alongside investigative journalist Neil Strauss and his team to find Elaine. But in light of recently uncovered digital evidence, a new pall of suspicion has been cast over Susan Park, Elaine's own mother. It was no secret that the mother-daughter relationship was not close. Neighbors recalled that they often heard fighting between the two, often late into the night. Elaine's friend Daisy, with whom she lived for a period, says of the relationship between Elaine and her mother, quote, They just didn't, I feel, like, care enough, which is sad. Her mom would kick her out a lot. Elaine didn't have keys sometimes because her mom would lock her out, literally change the locks. Her mom would blame her because her dad and her separated. Sadie, a close friend of Elaine, said Elaine's mother was reportedly very controlling and withholding to Elaine in regards to money in general, both in respect to the money that Elaine earned as an extra in film and television and in regards to a certain impending insurance payout, a main point of contention in their relationship, as evidenced in their recovered text messages. Although Elaine's phone would theoretically contain all of the messages sent between her and her mother in the days and hours leading up to her disappearance, her mother claims she accidentally activated the auto-delete function of the phone when she received it back from police, after no forensics were taken, by repeatedly entering the wrong password, an act that some now question was intentionally malicious as despite being told by P.I. Jaden Brandt to stop entering random guesses before the phone deleted everything, she continued to do so. However, not all information was lost, as Jaden Brandt, a private investigator of Origin Investigators Incorporated, who generously took on Elaine's case pro bono, was able to recover Elaine's most recent iCloud sync, and the text messages and emails he found did not cast Elaine's mother in a favorable light. Whereas initially, the private investigator was only able to recover a limited amount of data from Elaine's phone and computer, when a larger capacity MacBook with a larger drive was provided by Neil Strauss, all of a sudden more text messages began to populate, and a very grim and morbid picture began to take formation. In the messages between her and her mother, Elaine's responses were always conciliatory. She was definitely the more passive of the two. Elaine's friend Sadie recalls that prior to her disappearance, Elaine's mother and her argued about a contentiously soon-to-be-acquired insurance payout and how it would be divided. This insurance payment would become the center of controversy when it was discovered that Elaine's mother received the payment on her daughter's behalf 53 days after Elaine went missing, with Elaine's signature being forged on the payout document. In 2016, Elaine and her friend Sadie, who was the driver, had gotten into a car accident. Elaine heroically pulled at the car window's broken glass with her bare hands in order to get the trapped occupants of the other party's car. While her hands were bloodied and cut from this act of good Samaritanship, her body nor her back was actually injured, which is in direct opposition to what she told the insurance company in the ensuing days. Sadie theorizes that it was Elaine's mother who encouraged her to file this claim. Prior to the accident, Elaine loved attending hip-hop concerts, and her injuries did not prevent her from attending the myriad of shows in the ensuing months after the accident. In regards to the impending insurance payout, Elaine emailed her mother in June of 2016, quote, 
I already know you want the checks for my routing info for the insurance check. Once it arrives, it better be either linked directly to my checking account, or if it's a physical check, directly in my hands. The full amount. I'm going to call the office and make sure you're not pulling any snake SHIT either. In July of 2016, one month after this initial email, after an argument between her and her daughter in regards to Elaine going out to eat before seeing the chiropractor who would help bolster the insurance claim's validity, Elaine's mom texted her daughter the word die eight times. Die, 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 die. On Thursday, January 26th, 2017, roughly two days prior to her going missing at around 3.30 a.m., Elaine texted her mom a pin of her car's location. She was stranded on a bridge, her car having run out of gas, and while she was waiting for help, her car battery had died as well. Her mother, along with her boyfriend Jeff, drove out to assist Elaine in jumping her car and getting her gas. Jeff and Susan, Elaine's mother, claim that after they successfully got Elaine back home, she passed out on the couch. Her mom claims that Elaine was very skimpily dressed in a lingerie type of getup. Elaine's mother claims that when she and Jeff walked into the living room, Elaine shrieked in surprise and ran to her bedroom. Elaine's mom says that this was the last time she ever physically saw Elaine. Susan then says that she and her boyfriend Jeff left the house, and when they returned, they recalled that Elaine was still in her room, though they do not recall seeing or speaking with her. This is the last time her mom and Jeff say they ever physically knew Elaine to be in the home. This was one day prior to Elaine's last text communication with Susan, as backed up by Verizon's phone records. On Friday, January 27, 2017, the last day of communication between Elaine and Susan entailed Susan texting Elaine $20 using the quick pay feature of Apple and Elaine texting back that she'll return her mother the money by 6 p.m. that night. When she still hadn't received the $20 by 7 o'clock that evening, her mom texted Elaine to ask why she hadn't paid her back the money. Elaine, in what would be her last text communication between her and her mother digitally that investigators know of, replies to her mother's text from two hours prior, stating, give me until later tonight. On January 27th, Elaine went to the movies with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Divine Compare, known by his friends as Div. The film was called The Return of Xander Cage and was playing at the AMC Promenade at 10.45 p.m. The pair Ubered there and back, returning to Div's affluent family's property at around 1 a.m. in the early mornings of January 28th. This is confirmed via surveillance footage from the outside of their home. Less than five hours after arriving home from the movies, her boyfriend recalls that, for unknown reasons, Elaine woke up in a panic, visibly shaking. She then hastily left. Elaine exits her boyfriend's guest house at around 6.01 a.m., but the video is cut off at 6.05 a.m., just prior to Elaine actually getting into her car. However, a license plate reader on the Compare property verifies that Elaine's Honda Civic did in fact exit the gated community a few minutes later. Some critics point out that it was never clear who was actually driving the car when it exited the Compare property, as the only artifact for that is the license plate reader recording, and not the actual CCTV footage, due to an unfortunate twist of digital fate. 
The reason investigators do not have the critical footage of Elaine leaving is because before the CCTV could tell police what happened next, the footage cut out. An error, police claim, which occurred when they attempted to transfer the footage over from the camera's unit to one of their police storage devices. An act so commonplace and so frequently done by police that some have said it is almost beyond the scope of possibilities how such a highly funded department could be this untrained. The footage is lost forever as it was permanently erased. Div made a Twitter post on January 29th, one day after Elaine left his home in a panic, which was a retweet of someone else's posting, which said, quote, If a girl leaves some SHIT at my crib, it's getting thrown out immediately. Initially, while much of the focus was on Elaine's affluent boyfriend Div, as their relationship had been through its highs and lows, there is nothing which indicates that he ever had any contact with Elaine, digital or otherwise, after that hurried exit which she made in the early morning hours of January 28th. The Compare family have been helpful and forthcoming with investigators in the aftermath of Elaine's disappearance. At 10.41 a.m. on that day, Saturday the 27th, Susan texts Elaine what she says was a reminder. All records have been deleted, so there's no proof as to what exactly was in the text messages. Susan said that because she didn't receive a response, she called Elaine's phone and says that the phone went to voicemail after two rings. Susan then texts Elaine again, although records are lost as to what the text messages specifically contained. However, Susan says she was texting again about the $20. With no response, Susan said she checked Elaine's room and that she noticed Elaine's normal overnight bag was gone and that her makeup was also gone. Susan then said that she emailed and tried to contact her via Facebook to no avail. In another interview, Susan mentions that Elaine would often leave for nights on end without contact. So Susan claims that why she was immediately concerned is focused more around Elaine's lack of paying the money back than on Elaine's physical disappearance from the home. Susan Park, in an interview, says, quote, She didn't come home that night. I was, I remember, I stayed home that night. She didn't come home the next morning. Oh wait, was I home? I don't remember. The next day, Sunday, January 29th, Susan decides she wants to file a missing persons report because she says Elaine would have paid her back the $20, and the fact that she hasn't has worried her. On February 1st, after filing a missing persons report, Susan supposedly wrote the following message on the whiteboard on Elaine's room door. Elaine, as soon as you decide to come home and you are home, please let me know at your earliest. I am so worried. I do love you, Mom. This was dated February 1st, 2017. In regards to Susan's whereabouts on Friday night and into Saturday morning, Susan's timeline and alibi are varied. She first claimed she wasn't home, but later said the following in regards to the aftermath of Elaine's car running out of gas and her and Jeff having to rescue her prior to her going missing. So, because that incident, Friday night, Saturday night, middle of the night, I came home. I even told Jeff, I said, you know, I'm worried because she's having car problems. I need to go home. I think I did that consecutively, maybe like 2.30 or 2 o'clock or something, or 3 o'clock sometime. As I remember, there was no trace of Elaine. There was no trace. When Anne Marie, wife to Mike, who's the guitarist for the band Incubus, and a major researcher and amateur investigator in the case, alongside Ingrid, Neil Strauss's then wife, questioned Susan on why she would want to be at home when she would have needed Jeff's help with any potential car troubles that may arise, and Susan had no answer. Anne Marie asked Susan if she was indeed worried about potential car troubles with Elaine, why she would have insisted on coming home in the middle of the night. To that, Susan replied, quote, Yeah, I just wanted to be home with a, I don't know, like, if you put it that way, you know, I don't have an answer. On February 2nd, five days after Elaine was last seen on her boyfriend's home security footage, her car was found, seemingly parked and abandoned, although whether by choice or by force, it is unknown. 
Elaine's 2015 charcoal gray Honda Civic was found at Corral Beach in Malibu, parked on the shoulder of the 26,000 block of the Pacific Coast Highway. The car's doors were unlocked and the keys were still in the ignition, turned into the on position. The car's battery was dead. Elaine's phone was in the center console, her backpack on the seat, her laptop tucked safely inside along with $30. But while all of the material items that a young person would treasure were found in the car, there was still no sign of Elaine. With no note, no indication of a struggle, and no indication of a robbery, law enforcement bizarrely suggested that this could have been a case of suicide, where Elaine simply parked her car and then wandered into the ocean to end her life. No evidence via social media posts, text messages recovered, or eyewitness statements suggests that Elaine was suicidal. And while she, like most 20-year-olds, had her fair share of personal, familial, and relationship issues, by all indications, Elaine's focus was on self-care and positivity. In a seemingly continuous pattern of mistakes and procedural graphs of disastrous proportions by various Southern California law enforcement agencies, including the Glendale Police Department, as well as the Malibu Lost Hill Sheriff Station and Malibu Search and Rescue, there was absolutely no collection or testing of any of Elaine's mysteriously and abruptly abandoned personal items. With nothing being taken into custody for evidence processing, all of Elaine's belongings were given back to her family. Elaine's mom tells investigative journalist Neil Strauss that instead of preserving the artifacts for future testing or investigation, she washed and put away all of the belongings she received. Such a decision by police to not collect artifacts in the case brought back memories for locals of previous instances of investigatory mishap and many expressed frustration towards the law enforcement agencies tasked with protecting the area. Critics of the investigation questioned why police were not doing more about the fact that young people were going missing from this area in far greater proportion in recent years. A sentiment presumably echoed by the parents of Matthew Weaver and Matrice Richardson as well, who fought tirelessly to get investigators to take the cases of their children's fate more seriously. When asked about Elaine's borrowing of money to feed and transport herself, Susan admits that she did require Elaine to pay her back on a strict and unforgiving schedule through a cash app on their phones. At her mother's meticulous attempt at collecting on the debts, Elaine's friend Sadie recalls that Elaine often had to ask her mother for money, and her mother reportedly hounded her to repay on time, even the smallest amount. Elaine told Sadie that her mother had taken roughly $8,000 which she had earned of her own accord from working as an extra on film sets, and Elaine was worried that her mom might take the future insurance settlement as well. Everything was about money, Sadie recalls, and Elaine was never made to feel like a daughter, but more like a burden. Other red flags appear besides the lack of clarity surrounding the timeline and alibi of Susan including the fact that she cleaned Elaine's room in the days after her disappearance and washed all potential evidence received back from police. Susan also disabled and deleted Elaine's iPhone by trying the password F-U-C-K as the last attempt. And she did not tell the neighbors that Elaine was missing, nor did she put up any flyers in their neighborhood. Susan admits she never passed out flyers in her own neighborhood because she claimed she wanted the focus of the investigation to be on the Calabasas area. But she also admits that the situation was, quote, embarrassing because the neighbors had been privy to her and Elaine's loud arguments, being that their volume was so great it could be heard from neighboring yards. Elaine's mother talks in suspiciously erratic circles as she tries to explain why she deleted all of her text messages with Elaine. She at first attempts to explain the reasoning for their absence as born of a habitual need to clear her plate of already taken care of worries. But if Elaine had never texted her back, investigators wondered, why would her mother have deleted a text thread which was very much a current worry and very much not followed up upon? Susan then, without any pushback or prompting from interviewers, attempts to explain away the deletion as in fact being accidental, 
claiming that she actually had tried to lock, in her words, the text message, but that she accidentally deleted it instead. In an attempt to explain her desire to lock the text message, Susan then goes into a long-winded explanation of how she is a new iPhone user, having just switched over from a Samsung only two months prior. The issue with this explanation, Strauss points out in his report, but not to Susan herself in person, is that Elaine actually had texts in her computer from her mom regarding the same issue of, quote, locking a text message. And in this archive data, it was clear that Susan was told by her daughter that this function was not something one could do on an iPhone. This was two months prior to the supposed attempted locking of the text thread and then the accidental deletion, so why Susan would attempt to do this non-existent action again is confusing to some and evidence of a cover-up to others. While Susan claims her usage of her new iPhone was limited, she actually got her iPhone two months prior to her daughter's disappearance and had already been somewhat trained on the differences in platforms. She specifically was told that she could not lock text messages as one could do in a Samsung phone, yet then goes on to deviate from her original story not 10 minutes after. In her own words, Elaine's mother, Susan, claims that after she receives text messages, she deletes them so as to unclutter her text feed and, by extension, her mind. In order to prove such habitual actions, such as clearing old texts, she shows the investigative journalist her phone. But ultimately, this proves quite the contrary, as a cornucopia of old text messages, both followed up upon and unfollowed up upon, were visible, even though Susan had previously just said she deleted text messages which required no follow-up in order to clear her phone. According to this logic, Susan would have only cleared the text messages which no longer needed to be replied to, but she claimed Elaine's was not one of those, and that she was, quote, so worried at Elaine's lack of response. Following Susan's own logic, if one is to believe that she is a serial text deleter, but only of texts which have been, quote, taken care of, and already followed up upon, why did she delete Elaine's? If Susan's anxieties were in regards to the fact that she claimed she was concerned her daughter never texted her back, why delete the unanswered texts from the person she was most concerned about? The only records that exist of such text message interactions are through Verizon Wireless, which merely show the numbers that communicated and the times at which they happened, but not the actual content of the messages, which are lost forever. The investigative journalist, Neil Strauss, even candidly comments in his report that he himself is, quote, uncomfortable with the obvious contradictions and apparent discrepancies. While the strange deletion of key text messages between Elaine and Susan and the forced auto-deletion of Elaine's phone could be mere coincidence, investigative journalist Neil Strauss later uncovered more disturbing information regarding Susan's new boyfriend, Jeff, via Susan's close friend and confidant. Jeff's wife had passed away five or six years prior, via suicide, and in an interview with a close friend of Susan, she says that she believes that she was told by Susan herself that the wife's suicide was due to an overdose of pills. This fact alone may not seem suspicious, but it is a detail which becomes more eerie and ominous when Strauss recalls that Susan had, multiple times herself, introduced the prospect that her daughter may have committed suicide. Jeff also mentions suicide as a possibility when there were no outward signs by any human or digital account that Elaine was contemplating hurting herself or even that she was depressed. Three weeks after her only daughter went missing, Susan insisted in an interview with ABC News that she just wanted to find Elaine's, quote, body. Not Elaine, her body. Many believed that this use of the word body was a strange linguistic distinction to make, especially when no outward signs of a fatality were known to police. As three weeks in, Elaine was still being treated as a missing persons case and not a homicide. Susan later said in an interview on CNN's headline news network, quote, I don't know what happened. I just need to find her body. I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know. In a later interview, Susan said, quote, I thought it might be suicide, but they can't find the body. I still kind of feel in a way that she committed suicide and they just can't find the body in that spot. 
While Elaine's mother was the person who initially contacted the journalist, it came out that her motivation was more for money, as she believed that interacting with Neil Strauss would result in some sort of payday for her personally, in the form of a GoFundMe donation in her name. This was made known to Strauss when it was revealed that Susan had called a man named Brandon, the account executive for the charitable foundation that Mike Enzinger, the guitarist for Incubus, runs. It was found that Susan had called him directly and told him that the GoFundMe account needed a cash infusion as it had been depleted paying the private investigator, Jaden Brandt. But Jaden Brandt later showed Strauss the original contract signed by both he and Elaine's mother. And it shows that this was a fee-free case, pro bono, and with the exception of the cost of a few reimbursements, he had no record of any spending expenditures, which would have been involved with finding Elaine. Many involved wondered what had happened to the rest of the $15,000 in that GoFundMe account, and why would it need more? The friend closest to Susan, outside of her boyfriend, says that Susan seemed to fixate on the belief that Elaine's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Div, was responsible for her not coming home. But despite her outward complaints about Div, Elaine's mother refused to use the GoFundMe money raised by those concerned in order to pay a paltry fee of less than $30 for an official record of Div's phone. Well, Jaden and that close friend of Susan's would recall how she would wax on regarding her belief that Div was involved. The fact that she hoarded the GoFundMe money, claiming that she might need it for funeral expenses, when it could have gone towards real answers, was highly suspicious to Jaden, the private investigator, and one of the first red flags for him. While Susan told her friend that she believed Elaine's boyfriend to be involved, this was a deviation from the narrative that Susan perpetuated regarding Elaine's possible suicidality or prostitution connections. As Susan later changed her story in subsequent interviews, and she would later go on to imply that sex work could be a possible reason for Elaine's disappearance. Susan postulates that Elaine may have willingly gone into prostitution, or possibly that she was trafficked, a claim with no substantiation. Susan allowed the investigative journalist and his team to look at the items that had been in Elaine's car, which had been returned untested by police. Upon the initial inspection of those items, the lead singer of Incubus, Mike, also working on this case, recalls that the entire situation seemed almost staged as a business card Elaine had been supposedly given advertising exotic modeling or perhaps dancing was prominently displayed in her bag as if put there on purpose. Later, Susan showed an uncomfortable and actively protesting Neil Strauss some lingerie from Elaine's bedroom drawer. She said, quote, it's like a leather kinky stuff, you know, I would never even touch it. The reason why I mention it is that because at one point, they mention about if she's doing prostitution. Susan also gave Elaine's two cats, Coco and Bandit, up for adoption mere months after her disappearance. With all the red flags, it was arranged by Jaden Brandt, under the guise of more collection of possible data, to have scent dogs come to inspect the park home. Cadaver dogs usually require training for about 18 to 24 months and are highly effective. They have an accuracy of about 95% when it comes to detecting the chemicals which mark human remains. They are so specialized that they can sometimes smell a body that's been buried up to 15 feet below ground. Their sense of smell is so good that they can detect one drop of blood in 13 million gallons of water, allowing them to detect remains which have been submerged underwater for up to 30 meters. They are highly trained in distinguishing between human remains and animal remains and will not mistake one for the other. On May 6, 2017, two cadaver dogs searched the home of Elaine and Susan Park. And while this was six months after Elaine's disappearance, the specialized nature of such animals makes this time passage less important. In fact, the Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory found that dogs could detect the telltale chemicals of death even hundreds of years later. The first cadaver dog showed what is called focused interest in Elaine's bedroom. From the report itself, written by the handler of the two cadaver dogs, he says, quote, 
Upon smelling the outside of the bedroom door, the first dog smelled, sat, and looked at me, indicating an alert of an odor in which he has previously been trained. He also alerted on the floor molding in the hallway immediately near this door, in a small closet with cleaning supplies in the hallway, and in the clothes closet. Opening the closet door, he continued to show this focused interest in the contents, especially the suitcase and other items just inside the closet door. The only area of additional interest was a covered storage shed. The first dog showed interest inside the shed area, but did not localize to a single spot within it. Incidentally, on March 31st of 2017, two months after Elaine's disappearance, Susan made a new entry in her iPhone calendar, reminding her that at 9 a.m. she should, quote, hide it. This was the morning of the first time that members of the investigatory team would visit Elaine's room, a visit that was scheduled that day for 10.30 a.m., just one and a half hours after the first alert to hide it was made. That same day, after all the investigators on the team were scheduled to leave, Susan had an entry at 1.30 p.m. alerting her to, quote, put back hide items dash shed. All information, including the emails, text messages, insurance documents, and the cadaver dog report have been submitted to police, and the case is open and active. Any help from the public, however seemingly small, is welcomed and can be shared with local investigators of the Glendale Police Department. You can contact Sergeant Ernesto Gaxiola or Sergeant James Ross at 818-548-4067. An end note. Neil Strauss, an award-winning writer for Rolling Stone and a former reporter at the New York Times, is host to a podcast entitled To Live and Die in L.A., and is currently covering Elaine's story in meticulous detail. It is to him, along with his then-wife Ingrid, Mike, guitarist for Incubus, and his wife Anne-Marie, along with the team at Tenderfoot TV and Cadence 13, for whom we may thank for this exhaustive research and work. We hope you enjoyed our originally presented information. However, Neil Strauss's weekly podcast on the same subject is, in our opinion, both diligently researched and empathetically covered, and we highly recommend it to anyone interested in following the progression of this case in real time and have included a link in our source list in the description below. Thank you.